gonna tell God all of my troubles when I get home. I'm gonna tell Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Letters from the Heart, Ignatius Sancho and Benjamin Banneker. In the British parliamentary election of 1774, a whopping 100% of the black vote went to Earl Percy and Lord Thomas Pelham Clinton, who claimed the two seats in Parliament representing the important constituency of Westminster. We can say this with confidence because there was only one black voter. As far as we know, the first ever to vote in a British election, Ignatius Sancho, who also voted in the next election in 1780, again for the winning candidates. At the time, the franchise was extended only to men of sufficient wealth, a test Sancho could meet thanks to his ownership of a thriving grocery store. He's best remembered today, however, not for his pioneering participation in the political process, nor for his business acumen, nor even for what might seem to be his most remarkable accomplishment. He seems also to have been the first black person in history to publish musical compositions. Instead, he is best known as an eloquent writer of letters. Two years after his death in December of 1780, a woman named Frances Crewe edited and published a book entitled Letters of the Late Ignatius Sancho, an African, the proceeds of which went to Sancho's widow. It established him as a literary celebrity, comparable in fame to Phyllis Wheatley. Another black exponent of the epistolary art in the 18th century was Benjamin Banneker, his name is also remembered, but not so much for writing letters. Every year, especially during Black History Month, children learn about Banneker as an early American scientific genius, an astronomer who published almanacs, an ingenious clockmaker, and a surveyor involved in the creation of his nation's capital, Washington, D.C. As remarkable as all this is, Banneker is most important for our purposes because of a letter he sent in 1791 to Thomas Jefferson, who was at that point Secretary of State. In this letter, and some of those written by Sancho, we find philosophical reflections on the role of emotion and imagination in the stimulation of social change and the pursuit of justice. We will begin by discussing Sancho, whose early life illustrates the horrors of the slave trade. He is said to have been born in 1729, not in Africa, nor in the Americas, nor in his eventual beloved home, Great Britain, but rather on a slave ship crossing the Atlantic Ocean. The ship arrived at Cartagena, in present-day Colombia, where the infant boy's mother died of illness and his father committed suicide. This is where he was baptized and given the name Ignatius. As a two-year-old orphan, he was brought to England and given to three sisters who apparently wanted him to be nothing more than an ignorant slave. They are the ones who gave him the name Sancho, after Sancho Panza from Don Quixote. Sancho's fortunes turned when he met John, the Duke of Montague, who had previously befriended and assisted Job ben Solomon, mentioned in episode 32. After the duke's death, Sancho sought to live with his widow, the duchess, but was at first rebuffed. At this low point, he reportedly considered committing suicide like his father before him, but then the duchess reconsidered her position and took him on as a butler. He served in this role until her death, and she bequeathed him a year's salary as well as a healthy annuity. Unfortunately, Sancho apparently squandered much of his money on womanizing, gambling, and, more admirably and illustrating his deep love for the arts, the theater. Sancho even aspired to be an actor himself, but was hindered by a speech impediment. In 1758, he married Anne Osborne, a black woman from the Caribbean, and the pressures of a growing family made employment a necessity. Sancho, therefore, served as personal valet to the late Duke and Duchess's son-in-law, and his earliest known musical compositions date to this time. By 1773, though, he had to give up this position because of health problems relating to his weight and gout. Fortunately, his ability to handle money had by now improved, and he was able to make the transition from his career in service to the role of entrepreneur, opening the grocery store that kept him busy for the rest of his life. Being a grocer suited Sancho's difficulties with physical mobility, which may also help explain his prolific writing of letters to many friends in and around London. He wrote to people like William Stevenson, a printer, bookseller, and banker, Margaret Coxedge, possibly a governess to Francis Crewe, who edited Sancho's letters, and John Mayhew, a visual artist who received patronage from Sancho. 
His most famous correspondent, however, was the great British novelist Lawrence Stern, author of The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy. In a letter of July 21st, 1766, he praised Stern for the brilliance of his fiction and pressed him to work his opposition to slavery into his novels. Stern wrote back with gratitude and said that, as it happens, he had just been working on a tender-hearted tale of a black girl that suffered under slavery. When Stern's letters were posthumously published in 1775, this gave Sancho his first taste of fame, and put him on display as an articulate champion of the value of sentimentality in art. In his message to Stern, he begins by identifying himself as black, and stating how unlucky he was to spend the first part of his life in a household that enforced his ignorance as a means of securing his obedience. Yet he learned to read and write nonetheless, and says that in adulthood his chief pleasure has been in books. This may remind us of the trope of the talking book in slave narratives and other 18th century black literature. Sancho too points to the power of the written word and how it was withheld from him as a form of oppression, which then served to make his later mastery of it a central component and symbol of his freedom. In the letter, Sancho goes on to say, Philanthropy I adore, and confess how much he appreciates the character of Uncle Toby in Tristram Shandy, famously portrayed as unwilling to hurt a fly. Sancho declares he would walk ten miles in summer heat just to shake Uncle Toby's hand, which is probably about nine miles more than most of us would walk to shake anyone's hand. The show of devotion to a fictional character sets up Sancho's recommendation that Stern incorporate anti-slavery views into his fictional work. Sancho praises the affecting condemnation of slavery found in a book of sermons by Stern, and claims that if the subject of slavery were to be handled in Stern's distinctive style of storytelling, this would, as Sancho puts it, ease the yoke perhaps of many, but if only one, gracious God, what a feast to a benevolent heart. In line with this exuberance, Sancho eventually shifts from humble suggestion to confident assertion of what Stern simply must do for black people. Grief is eloquent. Figure to yourself their attitudes. Hear their supplicating addresses. Alas, you cannot refuse. Humanity must comply. Sancho draws a tight connection in this letter between the production of representational art, the emotional responses of individual readers, and the desired political outcome of broad social change. He suggests that the fictionalization of harsh realities is a uniquely powerful way to change those very realities by eliciting strong emotional reactions that can effectively motivate change. Given that activism against the slave trade was at best in its infancy at the time Sancho wrote to Stern, Sancho was articulating a pioneering strategy when he suggested using popular fiction to disseminate the anti-slavery message. Sancho's collected letters show that he was pioneering in another sense, too. He was the first black literary critic, or at least the first to write in a European language. In a letter of June of 1778 to John Mayhew, he compared Stern to other British authors, such as Henry Fielding and Jonathan Swift. Sancho acknowledges Swift, the famous author of Gulliver's Travels, as the first wit of this or any other nation, but differentiates between Swift's grave-faced irony and the way Stern lashes his whips with jolly laughter. Again, he here emphasizes literature's humanizing potential by celebrating how the mirthful dimension of Stern's writing enhances its emotional impact. Sancho writes, Swift and Stern were different in this. Stern was truly a noble philanthropist. Swift was rather cynical. What Swift would fret and fume at, such as the petty accidental sourings and bitters in life's cup, you plainly may see Stern would laugh at, and parry off by a larger humanity and regular goodwill to man. For Sancho, both humor and sorrow are tools with which literature can make us better people. In another letter, written in January of 1778, we find Sancho evaluating a fellow black author, Phyllis Wheatley. Her poems, he writes, do credit to nature and put art merely as art to the blush. Sancho follows Alexander Pope's essay on criticism by viewing closeness to nature as a standard of good creative writing, so this is apt praise for the famously Pope-loving Wheatley. Lest we be tempted to give any of the credit for Wheatley's achievement to her supposedly benevolent owners, though, Sancho adds, it reflects nothing either to the glory or generosity of her master, if she is still his slave, except he glories in the low vanity of having in his wanton power a mind animated by heaven a genius superior to himself. 
Two other themes in Sancho's letters worth mentioning are his concern for non-human animals and his religious universalism. Both come up in an August 1777 letter to Mayhew, headed with the word jackasses. Sancho describes his disgust upon seeing potato sellers overload and whip a poor donkey. This is, he declares, a too common evil, and for the honor of rationality, calls loudly for redress. This talk of rationality suggests that Sancho sees a role for reason as well as sentiment in reforming human behavior. He says he is convinced we feel instinctively the injuries of our fellow creatures. Both enslaved humans and beaten donkeys naturally provoke our sympathy, or at least they should. If we fail to intervene and offer help, this is because we have been socialized to ignore such natural sentiments. Sancho says he is convinced that the general inhumanity of mankind proceeds first from the cursed false principle of common education. To identify and unlearn these anti-sentimental habits is the job of reason. Rational reflection thus allows us to feel as we ought to, and act accordingly. Sancho believes that a second source of inhumanity is a total indifference, if not disbelief, of the Christian faith. He points out that Jesus rode a donkey when he triumphantly arrived in Jerusalem, and that this has always for him stamped a kind of uncommon value and dignity upon donkeys. But you shouldn't be an ass in your dealing with other animals either. Rather, he says, a heart and mind impressed with a firm belief of the Christian tenets must of course exercise itself in a constant, uniform, general philanthropy. Here, Sancho ignores the etymological restriction of the term philanthropy to the love of humankind. He suggests that recognizing our own dislike of pain, and therefore sympathizing with the desire of others to be free of pain, should mean, if we are consistent and therefore maximally rational, that we will sympathize with non-human animals, just as we sympathize with other humans. Sancho jokes that if Mayhew would write something about the mistreatment of donkeys for the Morning Post, he will bray his thanks. Given the racial context, this is more than just an amusing aside. Systems of white supremacy in general, and slavery in particular, tend to depict black people as comparable to non-human animals. So Sancho's joke involves a provocative embrace of identification with non-human animals, an empathy that was already easy to read into the image of an overburdened creature driven by the whip. Putting all this together, Sancho's implicit message is that it is rational to embrace an emotional reaction of sympathy with both suffering animals and suffering Africans. After a few more quotidian yet revealing details, Mrs. Sancho wants to send Mayhew some tamarinds, and Sancho just took one of his daughters to see a famous actor friend play Falstaff in Shakespeare's Henry IV Part I, the letter's final paragraph brings us once again into philosophical territory. Sancho writes, I am reading a little pamphlet which I much like. It favors an opinion which I have long indulged, which is the improbability of eternal damnation, a thought which almost petrifies one, and in my opinion derogatory to the fullness, glory, and benefit of the blessed expiation of the Son of the Most High God, who died for the sins of all, all, Jew, Turk, infidel, and heretic, bare, sallow, brown, tawny, black, and you, and I, and every son and daughter of Adam. Here we see again the connection between rational consistency and compassionate sentiment. The damnation of non-Christians is inconsistent with Christianity, given the nature of divine goodness as Sancho understands it. This contrasts vividly with other black writers we have discussed, who were wedded to Calvinist forms of Christianity, according to which God saves whomever he chooses to save, with only believing Christians among the elect. Thomas Jefferson provides us with a link between Sancho and our other main character in this episode, Benjamin Banneker. Not that Sancho and Jefferson corresponded or had much in common politically. Sancho did not live to see the outcome of the Revolutionary War, but consistently celebrated any sign of British victory in his letters and fervently wished for peace in the form of an empire reunited. The connection is rather that Jefferson wrote about Sancho in his book, Notes on the State of Virginia, first published in 1785 while Jefferson was minister to France. For Jefferson, Sancho was the best possible example of a black intellect. This sounds like high praise, but it isn't. Jefferson discusses Sancho in the infamous part of Notes on the State of Virginia, in which he attempts a systematic argument for the natural inferiority of black people. The section forms a digression brought on by his proposal to emancipate all slaves in Virginia, followed by removing them from the state. 
Though he hypocritically owned hundreds of slaves throughout his entire life, Jefferson consistently took the position in his writings that slavery is a wrong that must be terminated. Black people should be freed, and then sent away from America, for two main reasons. First, Jefferson expected lasting enmity between the emancipated slaves and their former masters, which could eventually result in a war of extermination. Second, he thought white people had an evident physical and intellectual superiority that would be undermined if proximity caused them regularly to procreate with black people. And again, Jefferson is famously hypocritical here, as he is known to have fathered six children with his slave, Sally Hemings. It is while arguing for the intellectual inferiority of black people that he comments on Phyllis Wheatley, as we discussed in episode 33, and on Sancho. Though unwilling to admit that Wheatley was a true poet, he acknowledges some limited value in Sancho's letters, in a passage that's worth quoting at length. Ignatius Sancho has approached nearer to merit in composition, yet his letters do more honor to the heart than the head. They breathe the purest effusions of friendship and general philanthropy, and show how great a degree of the latter may be compounded with strong religious zeal. He is often happy in the turn of his compliments, and his style is easy and familiar, except when he affects a Shandian fabrication of words. But his imagination is wild and extravagant, escapes incessantly from every restraint of reason and taste, and in the course of its vagaries leaves a tract of thought as incoherent and eccentric as is the course of a meteor through the sky. His subjects should often have led him to a process of sober reasoning, yet we find him always substituting sentiment for demonstration. Upon the whole, though, we admit him to the first place among those of his own color who have presented themselves to the public judgment, yet when we compare him with the writers of the race among whom he lived, and particularly with the epistolary class in which he has taken his own stand, we are compelled to enroll him at the bottom of the column. This criticism supposes the letters published under his name to be genuine, and to have received amendment from no other hand, points which would not be of easy investigation. There is much that is repulsive and grating in the dismissive tone Jefferson adopts here. Sancho proves the rule by being exceptional, the best ever black writer, yet still rather mediocre. Still, Jefferson's remarks are not without insight. He puts his finger on the question we too have highlighted of the proper relationship between sentiment and sober reasoning. Could it be that Sancho does not so much substitute sentiment for demonstration as reveal just how essential sentiment is to cogent reasoning about ethics and aesthetics? The correspondence between Banneker and Jefferson presses this same issue. Benjamin Banneker initiated this exchange as one between two men of science, and yet in his letter notably links scientific reasoning to the experience of tender emotion. Before we get into this, though, let's say something about Banneker's life. He was descended from an indentured servant from England, who, after becoming independent, bought but eventually freed and married one of her own slaves, a man named Banaka or Banaki, who had been an African prince before being abducted and transported across the Atlantic. Their daughter married another freed slave, who had also been born in Africa. The eldest son of this union was Benjamin, who was born in 1731 and grew up helping on the family's tobacco farm. In his early twenties, a budding interest in all things scientific and mathematical led him to an impressive accomplishment. Someone lent him a pocket watch, and he took it apart. Once he understood its mechanism, he set himself the task of constructing a clock of his own. He succeeded, building a functioning clock almost completely out of wood, to the astonishment of those living near the family farm. Significant for Banneker's subsequent development was his relationship with George Ellicott, a wealthy young man who befriended Banneker and supplied him with books about astronomy and instruments, such as a telescope. Astronomy became his passion, and he eventually fulfilled his new ambition by producing an almanac. This required calculating the varying positions of celestial bodies over time in order to make predictions for the coming year concerning weather, tides, eclipses, and phases of the moon, and so on. Almanacs also regularly featured historical, literary, and philosophical tidbits meant to entertain and edify readers. While at work on his almanac, Banneker was chosen in 1791 by another member of the Ellicott family to help survey the land selected by President Washington for the construction of the new capital of the United States. Banneker's role included the use of a special clock made for making astronomical observations, thus combining his areas of expertise. The Georgetown Weekly Ledger reported on Banneker's participation, writing that Ellicott was attended by Benjamin Banneker, an Ethiopian, 
whose abilities as a surveyor and an astronomer clearly prove that Mr. Jefferson's concluding that race of men were void of mental endowments was without foundation. This brings us back to Banneker's letter to Jefferson, sent that same year. As one biographer has written, 1791 was truly his Annus Mirabilis, his Year of Wonders, when the survey of the federal territory was carried out and his first almanac was published. In August of that year, Banneker sent an advanced copy of the almanac to Jefferson, accompanied by this remarkable letter. Unlike that newspaper columnist, Banneker makes no reference to Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia. He may even have been unfamiliar with Jefferson's views on black inferiority, because he wrote, I suppose it is a truth too well attested to you to need a proof here, that we are a race of beings who have long labored under the abuse and censure of the world, that we have long been looked upon with an eye of contempt, and that we have long been considered rather as brutish than human, and scarcely capable of mental endowments. Sir, I hope I may safely admit, in consequence of that report which hath reached me, that you are a man far less inflexible in sentiments of this nature than many others, that you are measurably friendly and well disposed toward us, and that you are willing and ready to lend your aid and assistance to our relief from those many distresses and numerous calamities to which we are reduced. But in fact, we need not assume that Banneker was simply ignorant of that notorious section in the notes. Jefferson's heinous conclusion there had been framed in the hesitant language of the experimental method. I advance it therefore as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. Banneker appeals to this Jefferson, the one who likes to think of himself as a man of science, one who is less inflexible. Such a man can and should let the facts overwhelm his prejudice. Banneker also appeals to Jefferson as the author of the Declaration of Independence, which speaks of God-given inalienable rights, and also the author of those parts of the Notes on Virginia that are critical of slavery. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. Banneker expects Jefferson to agree that the Creator hath not only made us all of one flesh, but hath also without partiality afforded us all the same sensations and endowed us all with the same faculties. That allusion to universal human sensations brings us back to the question of emotion and reason. Prejudice against others, says Banneker, can be overcome by drawing proper inferences from the experience of self-love. He writes, Sir, I have long been convinced that if your love for yourselves and for those inestimable laws which preserve to you the rights of human nature was founded on sincerity, you could not be but solicitous that every individual of whatsoever rank or distinction might with you equally enjoy the blessings thereof. The argument here may remind us of Lemuel Haynes's essay, Liberty Further Extended. Banneker encourages Jefferson to think back to the uprising against the British crown, as a time in which he clearly saw into the injustice of a state of slavery, and in which he had just apprehensions of the horrors of its condition. Jefferson and other white Americans need only recall the tender feelings for themselves they felt at the time. This would allow them to follow the recommendation made by the suffering Job to his friends in the Bible, put their souls in his soul's stead. In the letter's most audacious moment of all, Banneker attacks Jefferson's hypocrisy. Sir, how pitiable it is to reflect that although you were so fully convinced of the benevolence of the Father of mankind, and of his equal and impartial distribution of those rights and privileges which he had conferred upon them, that you should at the same time counteract his mercies in detaining by fraud and violence so numerous a part of my brethren under groaning captivity and cruel oppression, that you should at the same time be found guilty of that most criminal act which you professedly detested in others with respect to yourselves. Banneker lays out no political plan of action, Instead, he places his trust in the sympathy Jefferson and others like him will feel if they would only more vividly imagine what black people experience by reflecting on their own feelings of self-love. Once this form of imaginative sympathy takes root, the same sympathy Sancho thought could be provoked by works of fiction, there will be no need for policy recommendations. As Banneker puts it, Thus shall your hearts be enlarged with kindness and benevolence toward them, and thus shall you need neither the direction of myself or others in what manner to proceed herein. For Banneker, as for Sancho, tender sentiment is the essential first step in securing social progress. 
Jefferson sent a gracious reply to Banneker about a week and a half later, complimenting Banneker while depicting himself as virtuously open-minded. Nobody wishes more than I do to see such proofs as you exhibit, that nature has given to our black brethren talents equal to those of the other colors of men, and that the appearance of a want of them is owing merely to the degraded condition of their existence, both in Africa and America. He informed Banneker that he was sending the almanac to the Marquis de Condorcet, secretary of the Academy of Sciences in France, as a testament in favor of black people. And in fact, his letter to Condorcet, which also survives, describes Banneker as a very respectable mathematician. Jefferson also indulges in a bit of exaggeration by taking credit for procuring Banneker's services in the surveying of the new capital. Almost two decades later, though, he sang a different tune. Writing to his friend Joel Barlow, Jefferson suggested he always had a low opinion of Banneker, writing, We know he had spherical trigonometry enough to make almanacs, but not without the suspicion of aid from Ellicott, who was his neighbor and friend, and never missed an opportunity of puffing him. I have had a long letter from Banneker which shows him to have had a mind of very common stature indeed. Ultimately, then, Jefferson's belief in black inferiority was harder to shake than the hand of someone ten miles away. Yet, after his death in 1806, Banneker was remembered as a scientific genius, the likes of whom the Africana tradition had not seen since Imhotep, who we discussed in episode 4. To be fair, his accomplishments are often greatly exaggerated. He's been credited not merely with building a wooden clock from scratch, but with inventing America's first clock. Not merely with being a mainly self-trot astronomer, but with being the first American astronomer. Not merely with publishing the six almanacs he published for the years 1792 to 1797, but with being the first in America to publish an almanac at all. He didn't just assist in surveying the land that became Washington, D.C., but supposedly designed the city himself. But such embellishments are unnecessary. As Silvio Bedini, author of the most authoritative and credible biography on Banneker, has said, Banneker's attainments, which were impressive and substantial, should be truthfully reported and evaluated, and his philosophy should be properly understood, in order that it may serve as an example to others. We concur, and would note for anyone out there looking for a nice research project that little attention has been paid to the philosophical thoughts Banneker included in his almanacs. On our own calendar, two weeks from today, is a trip back across the ocean to Sancho's London, or rather the London of those Afro-British writers who came after him in the 1780s. The two most important such writers, Olauda Equiano and Kopna Otoba Kuguano, were friends and helped to lead a larger group of pioneering black activists known as the Sons of Africa. So mark that in your almanac with bold letters, and make sure you don't miss the next installment of The History of Africana Philosophy. I'm gonna tell him I had heart trials Tell him I had